Great to have you here on the Telco AI Deep Dive series to learn a little bit about how you're thinking about AI, how Ericsson is thinking about AI. And I guess to maybe set the stage, it's fair to say generative AI is having a moment with the kind of mainstream attention being paid to things like Chatbeat, GPT, and Midjourney. But before we talk about what's happening now and what you see happening down the line, let's take a bit of a historical look back. So maybe give us uh, a little bit of commentary around Ericsson One, this uh, subunit within the larger business, and how your voice and video AI solutions uh, came to be. Yeah, of course. Um, thanks for having me. Really excited to do this and uh, kind of unwrap what we've been cooking up uh, on the voice and video AI team. So a little background on Ericsson One. Ericsson One is actually an internal venture arm, uh, the Google X of Ericsson, if you will. Um, they make all sorts of bets, some closer to the core business, some a little bit more out there, and some that sit a little bit in between to kind of uh, make big bets on the future, uh, generally kind of connected to communication and connection and, and how we uh, speak or, or, or talk to one another. Um, so what we do on the voice and video AI team is we work on AI enhancements uh, to voice and video communications. Uh, so that can manifest in a lot of different ways. Um, what we're releasing to market first is actually voice and video translation. So you'll be able to have a video call like this and be speaking a different language. It'll sound like you um, and it'll also look like you. So your face will be modified to actually look like it's speaking the target language. Um, the great thing about this is this is actually a market that already exists and really taking it to the next level, amplifying it, if you will. Um, and maybe even giving people abilities that they didn't have before to connect in these new and interesting ways. Um, this is kind of the first, uh, let's say, step in our vision. A lot of the stuff that we work on is kind of fundamental AI technology on uh, how people communicate. Um, so the same algorithms that we're using for experiences like real-time translation, uh, they can be actually kind of flipped on their head and be used for things like photorealistic avatars and 3D communication in the future. But it's an important kind of stepping stone here with the mediums of today. How much impact can we have uh, with what we can do now? Okay, so that brings us to present when there's really broad interest among virtually all types of businesses around leveraging AI. That's both generative and more traditional AI. So maybe you could walk us through the solutions that you have what kind of capabilities they bring to the table and maybe the target customers for your voice and video AI. Sure thing. So our target customers are definitely to start with enterprises. Um, I mean, enterprises connect uh, with other enterprises, with end users in all these different ways right now. And we see giving them the ability to basically speak different languages as essential to their growth. Um, right now, uh, they, they reach their end users and their end users reach each other with a very kind of traditional uh, medium. And there is really just the ways that we've been communicating for years now that, of course, exploded with the pandemic and, and other forces like that, uh, but can be taken to the next level if we can now connect with people we couldn't connect with before. Um, so our buyers are the enterprises, but there is kind of uh, this education that needs to happen that this is even possible. Um, so right now we actually partner with uh, what are called language service providers and language service providers already have an existing industry of translation services, localization services. They do everything from uh, localizing a, a news conference to a website and they already have these kind of hooks into the workflows and processes of these enterprises. And we go through them to kind of make sure we can make the most impact as fast as possible. Um, so it's kind of a bit of a... I would say an ecosystem that's being built as we speak. Um, and the first part of building that ecosystem is even letting know uh, people that this is possible because it seems a little sci-fi until you see it working in action. So if you look across your engagement at some of the sectors that are leveraging your solutions and other AI solutions, any observations between you know, what they'd like to do with the tech and what they are organizationally capable of doing in the short term? I think uh, maybe there is a, a red thread through there about the need for it to be super simple to deploy and also kind of they want to start small and then grow how they use it and to what extent over time. 
Um, if I could give an example, right now you can use our APIs to do everything from voice to video translation, but a lot of our initial customers and partners want to start with just the voice and see what kind of impact that has, uh, because it's a little bit easier to start with that, a little bit less, uh, let's say, advanced to only manipulate your voice as opposed to your voice and the video. And we're kind of seeing this pattern emerge that, okay, this is awesome. Uh, how quickly can I try it? How easy is it for me to try it? And can I start small and then kind of grow uh, as the experience starts to have an impact with my end users? You know, like with any technology that opens up all these exciting new opportunities, there's kind of a, a flip side to, to AI. And I, I am interested to hear from you, you know, how you're thinking about what bad actors could do with these types of tools. So maybe break that apart a little bit. So how are you addressing potential mistrust in AI? And how are you trying to make the technology transparent and understandable to the end user? You know, I've been, it's a big job and I'm not suggesting that it's just for Ericsson to solve, but just specifically, what are you doing? What are you seeing in that space? So first of all, I think this is a super timely question with, happen, with, with, with what happened this last weekend. <laughs> and if you know, you know. Um, I think uh, that's a very complex question. Uh, and I think the answer is uh, maybe not even just on the part of the safety and the ethics of it. It's even how you build it uh, from the start. Um, one of the things that kind of is a huge issue that maybe is kind of fallen by the wayside because now technology is super advanced and you see it having impact, whether it's correct or not, is the bias that goes into building these algorithms. So when we started this, uh, one of the core kind of tenets of what we were building is that this has to work for everybody and it has to work super well and super fairly. So we've actually behind the scenes been collecting an extremely expressive data set on humans. So uh, we have this whole operation where we collect very fairly and very uh, clearly uh, data from uh, subjects that come into a studio and we create data sets to create these AI algorithms. And we're kind of betting that just the sheer amount of data and the care and kind of meticulous approach we're taking to the actual foundation of this AI that we're building is going to pay dividends in the future. Um, it may initially manifest as we have algorithms that maybe have the least amount of bias or they're the most fair and maybe eventually manifest into we have uh, protections in place to make sure that our technology can't be misused because we have really, really, really great data to actually build those things. A lot of the times you'll see that uh, uh, there will be firms that say they can check uh, for misuse, uh, but they're kind of making a best effort because that's the best they can do with the data that, that they're collecting. Uh, so we're kind of betting that putting all this effort in on the front end allows us to do those things more properly or at least empirically more correctly in the future. Um, all that to say, I think it's an important thing for us to do. Um, but I will be completely frank here in that there is no correct answer yet on how to do these things of preventing misuse and uh, building in a way that it can't be spoofed. That all kind of needs to be figured out. Um, and our way to do that is to work with trusted partners in the beginning to make sure we give ourselves the time and kind of the learning experience with the initial customers uh, to build those systems and put them in place. So where do you see the biggest potential for AI today and maybe on a, a kind of shorter term time horizon? You know, what should companies be prioritizing and what kind of use cases can we realistically expect to see? So I would say for us more narrowly and specifically, uh, we feel that we're at an inflection point. Um, with the kind of stuff that we build, there's what they call the uncanny valley where it's it's almost good enough, almost good enough. And then it hits a point where, hey, okay, now I can really see myself using this. And I think that's just around the corner if we haven't hit it already. And right after that, we do see that ramp kind of starting to build and, and heat up into next year. Um, I think more broadly, because uh, we are a form of generative AI and, and this space is obviously heating up, um, I think certain applications have already beat that uncanny valley, but now there is the aspect of need to build trust, uh, not just with the end user, but with the companies, enterprises, and, and, and organizations deploying services for the end user. I would say that that trust isn't necessarily all the way there yet. Um, there's enough happening in the other direction of, hey, can we really trust this yet? 
uh, that I think there's still a bit of time before you see that explosion where it's anywhere and everywhere. Um, we're maybe more in that phase right below that explosion point where it's okay. There is actually probably value in this and I can currently use it for this percentage of my tasks, uh, but it's not yet, uh, let's say search engine level where maybe I go there first all the time. Um, and I think that's probably still a couple, couple years out, um, but there are probably more qualified people that are building those systems uh, that have better answers on that regard. And one last question here, Parth, and this is something that's come up in a number of these Telco AI deep dive videos, and that's really around how pressing it, it is for enterprises to develop a strategy and operationalize the solutions that, that kind of meet that strategy. So do you think fast followers will be in kind of a a position of defense or do you think that taking a, a maybe a more studied more conservative approach will be correct or you know is it a, like most things and kind of a somewhere in the middle i think uh it depends probably on the use case and the industry uh and we're even seeing this with what we specifically do for example a medical use case has a much higher bar or for what they even consider acceptable to even start engaging with, as opposed to, let's say, an influencer or a social media use case. So I don't think there is one right answer. Uh, I don't even know if the answer is somewhere in the middle. It's more that you kind of have to look at it more holistically, uh, who is going to be using this, uh, because you're not just usually building it just for yourself, right? It's for your users or for your partners or for those in your value chain. Um, and how are they going to be using it? And what is the net impact if, it doesn't go right, or if there is ethical concerns or constraints that we need to put in, or if it isn't correct all the time. Um, I think that kind of analysis probably needs to be done holistically within the company that's deploying this to understand the pace at which they should try and roll something out. We do that even ourselves internally um, because we have maybe uh, a group of partners we can work with, but we know some can move faster just because of the nature of what they do and the, the types of customers they serve as opposed to others, even though those others might be just as valuable. And we kind of always have to balance the scales. Well, Parth, I really appreciate you taking the time to join me today and to share some thoughts with our audience about how Ericsson's thinking big picture about AI and specifically about your voice and video AI solutions. Great to catch up with you.